So tonight I wanted to shift gears from the uh, Buddhist tradition of Lama Shabkar and uh, turn to another great uh, tradition and a great saint, uh, as who I mentioned, uh, I think, last time, uh, a saint of the Syriac church in the uh, 600s. And his name is Isaac the Syrian, at least that's what he's called, sometimes Isaac of Nineveh. This book, uh, The Spiritual World of Isaac the Syrian by Hilarion Alfeyev, is an excellent uh, introduction because it's, a, it's an incredible compendium of quotations, as you can see. I've uh, noted a lot of them. I will not try to read all of them. Uh, but uh, what's, what's extraordinary <clears throat> about uh, 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 not only uh, St. Isaac, but of the Syriac church of that time, which is one of the earliest churches that received uh, its, uh, its jnana directly from uh, Yeshua and the first uh, disciples. It, it was uh, a, a very early uh, church where the, uh, and, and it was, although it's called the Syriac church, it, it is, uh, it extended all the way to Persia. And uh, Isaac was actually born in what's currently called Qatar. Uh, but it was uh, a, uh, a Sassanid empire, so there was uh, a, you know, a, an Islamic takeover, uh, basically during his lifetime, a regime change, which had huge effects on the, uh, on the church but it nonetheless was able to sustain its integrity largely because of the, uh, the great mystics who, who sustained it in those times, uh, including uh, St. Ephraim, and, and uh, he was in about a few hundred years earlier, and then St. Isaac. So the three main churches are the Latin, the Greek and Russian Orthodox, and the Syriac. Uh, and then you have offshoots, uh, the Coptic in Egypt, and if you, the, the Syriac church extended all the way into India, where it's called the Syro-Malabar uh, church, and, uh, and then beyond into China, where it morphed to, uh, by fusing with uh, Taoism. And, uh, and there is also a Sufi tradition in China that, that has integrated with Taoism and, uh, and with Chan and Zen. And, and these are very uh, fascinating forms of Christianities. Uh, but I want to focus uh, basically on, on uh, the, well, let, let me put it this way. S Isaac the Syrian takes you from the earliest stages of the spiritual journey, where you're totally enmeshed in the Anavamala, uh, to use the Kashmiri term, of believing you're an individual being in a world and, and God is beyond, to that point where um, the, the reality, the truth of, of, of non-duality opens up. <clears throat> and his uh, insistent focus is on bringing the mind to stillness, right? No different than the Buddhist tradition or Advaita or, or Taoism or Shaivism, whatever, all have the same agenda. But uh, the Syriac church and Isaac have a different uh, approach uh, to that because uh, it is a very uh, deliberate and conscious form of bhakti, unlike the non-dualities of the East that tend to uh, begin with uh, the, the understanding that you're not really in bondage and uh, you're always already in the consciousness of the one self. Uh, and, and this can actually uh, 
a boomerang on the ego that uh, will misinterpret that as meaning, well, then I don't need to do anything, uh, rather than in order to realize that I must annihilate the illusory ego by uh, stopping completely its chattering narratives. So uh, he goes, I'm going to start with the second last stage of prayer, according to Isaac, which he calls luminous meditation. And there's, there's one step beyond it, which he calls mystical wonder. And here's a quote by him. If you're desirous of tasting the love of God, my brother, ponder and with understanding meditate on the things that pertain to him and which have to do with him and his holy nature. Meditate and ponder mentally. Cause your intellect to wander on this all your time. In other words, don't wander into ego thoughts. Wander totally into the, 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 the fascination with the presence of the energy of God within. And then you will become aware of how all the parts of your soul become inflamed with love as a burning flame alights on your heart and desire for God excels in you. This luminous meditation on God is the goal of prayer, or rather it is the fountainhead of prayers in that prayer itself ends in this pure reflection on God. And there are times when a person is transported from prayer to a wondrous meditation on God. In other words, emaho, right? That's what he's talking about. And there are times when prayer is born out of meditating on God. All these are different stages in the course run in divine fashion by the intellect in the stadium of this world. Each person having his gaze fixed on the crown. I would say the crown chakra is what he's referring to. The crown of the solitary is the spiritual enjoyment of Christ, our Lord. Whoever has found this has received from this world a pledge of those things which are to come. Okay, so he's already getting uh, intimations of sat, Yuga. So, uh, and then the next phase, which uh, is the complete stillness of the mind, which he calls spiritual prayer. The saints of the age to come, right, which is not Sat Yuga, but Sangam Yuga, the age that Sat Yogis are in to create Sat Yuga, the sages of the age to come do not pray with prayer when their intellects have been swallowed up by the spirit, but rather with awestruck wonder, they dwell in that gladdening glory. So it is with us at the time when the intellect is deemed worthy to perceive the future blessedness. It forgets itself and all things of the world and no longer has movement with regard to anything. So complete stillness of mind brings one into the vibrational frequency of God. And then he says, in the life of the spirit, then there is no longer any prayer. Every kind of prayer that exists consists on the level of the soul of beauteous thoughts which arise, but on the level and life of the spirit, there are no thoughts, no stirrings, no, not even any sensation or the slightest movement of the soul concerning anything. For human nature completely departs and from and departs from these things of the world and from all that belongs to itself. Instead, it remains in a certain ineffable and inexplicable silence. The Kashmiris use the same word, inexplicable, anakya, in Sanskrit. 
for the workings of the Holy Spirit stirs in it, having been raised above the realm of the soul's understanding. So the soul is transported beyond itself into the stillness of the Supreme Lord. When the mind is entirely without any kind of reflection, that is silence of the mind. It's not purity of prayer, because it's one thing to pray purely, which is you know, one-pointed and, uh, and, and with uh, total devotion and adoration. But it's quite another for the mind to be perfectly silent from any wandering at all, or even from any insights into the words of prayer, and to remain without any stirring. And then he adds, interestingly, no one is so stupid as to want to find this by means of struggle and strength of his own will, for this is the gift of revelation to the intellect, and it is not within the reach of pure prayer. You can't pray for this. It's not a matter of the will. It's grace. Okay? So it's very difficult, I think, for most postmodern egos to recognize the reality of grace and to be humble enough to ask for it. And see, when you believe that non-duality is already the truth and, and you, you don't recognize that as long as you believe you are a being in a world, your only way to God is through humility, through surrender, total surrender, until there is absolute stillness. And that is the portal to the grace. The grace comes when one has given oneself in that way. And this stage is sometimes called theoria, where theory comes from, but it means the vision of God. And sometimes it's called knowledge, he says, which is meaning jnana, gnosis. And other times the revelation of the noetic essence of God consciousness. So once the intellect enters the realm of stillness, it ceases from prayer because it ceases from all mental movement. And as soon as the governance and the stewardship of the spirit rule the intellect, in other words, you've been taken over by God, then a man's nature is deprived of its free will and is led by another guidance. This is extremely important. In this phase, God takes over. You have, you have no more will of your own. It is the will of God that then brings the intellect into the final state. So where then will prayer be when a man's nature has no authority over itself, but is led whither it knows not by some other power and is not able to direct the movements of the mind and what it chooses, but at that moment is held fast in a captivity by which it is guided whither it does not perceive. But according to the testimony of Scripture at such a time, a man will not possess a will, nor will he know whether he is in the body or out of body. This is a very beautiful description of someone who obviously has been there and it's absolutely uh, accurate and congruent with all the traditions. There's more I could read, but I'm going to skip. OK. On the wings of faith, then she soars. The soul soars aloft, taking leave of visible creation. She becomes as one drunken in awestruck wonder of her continual solicitude for God and by simple, uncompounded vision 
and by unseeing intuitions concerning the divine nature. God has no parts. It's absolute simplicity and total stillness because it's beyond time and space. It's the same as when Ramana says in the final stage of Ajatavada, there is no world, there's never been a world. There's only the self. This is the reaching of that through surrender. It is not possible that even one in a thousand righteous men should be accounted worthy of this lofty noetic perception. And indeed, the theoria concerning our Lord's incarnation and manifestation in the flesh is also said to arise from this theoria concerning the divinity. In other words, you will recapitulate the christening of Christ, the absolute realization, whether it happened during the baptism with John the Baptist or in the desert, but there was that moment. And this same moment is our uh, destiny when we have surrendered. Thank you.